Hello and welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock and uh, this week's show is a special Pennsylvania Hemp Summit edition and it's going to be a little different than the normal program, right? I'm not going to interview anyone this week, but I am going to uh, play audio from the summit. So if you weren't able to make it to the summit, uh, this is a a way to sort of catch up and find out what happened. There were some really uh, special moments. There were great speakers and panel discussions. And uh, yeah, so I thought this week's show, we just do a little bit of a recap, uh, specifically a recap of the Monday night session. So on this show here today, we're going to hear uh, the introduction from the MC, and then we're going to hear the Secretary of Agriculture from Pennsylvania, Russ Redding, give his opening remarks, and then we're going to hear some parts of the keynote speaker. And then after the keynote speech, there was a couple of panel discussions and a, a Q&A session with legislators. That was why they had it in Harrisburg this year, so you could get a bunch of lawmakers out there to understand what the hemp industry needs and they showed up there was like 12 or more pennsylvania state lawmakers in attendance and uh, it was great to see that so a couple of things i should mention uh the first one being i'm coming down with a cold i don't feel so hot and i don't think i sound sort of the same as i normally do but anyway the other thing is uh, the audio quality on this show, you know, maybe not always the best, but I'm trying my best to bring you quality audio. So I appreciate your patience and understanding in that sense. So I guess we're going to just jump into it. I will mention that uh, our sponsor this week is IND Hemp, but I'm not going to play the normal message because you're going to hear from Ken Elliott from IND Hemp quite a bit on this episode because he was the keynote speaker. So that was pretty cool. Anyway, uh, yeah, here's how it started. Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone to the 2022 Pennsylvania Hemp Summit. It's great to see you all here tonight. We've got an interesting program here for you. Uh, My name is Eric Herlock. I'm a journalist at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Lancaster Farming is proud to be the media sponsor for the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit. At Lancaster Farming, we see industrial hemp as a new and vast opportunity for our farmers here in PA and around the country. So for the past four years, I've been covering the hemp industry on the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. I've interviewed hundreds of people in and around the hemp industry, not just here in PA, but around the country, around the world. Uh, I am not an expert by any means, but I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what's happening in the industry and uh, what the industry needs to move forward. So real quick, two things that I think we need. First thing we need is smart, sensible, simple regulation. We need to let industrial hemp flourish. And I'm talking about fiber and grain here. Hemp is not marijuana and we have to stop treating it like it is. Number two, we need investment in processing capacity and supply chain development. We need more money here to build the infrastructure. And it's not a matter of getting farmers to grow hemp. Our farmers are going to grow the best hemp in the world, but they need markets first, which is where regulation and investment come in. Uh, Last summer, I took my podcast on the road and I traveled around the country. Uh, I wanted to see how the hemp industry was shaping up elsewhere. And I wanted to see it with my own eyes. And there's a lot of great things happening out there in Kansas, Kentucky, Colorado, Montana. And I want those things to be happening here in Pennsylvania. So as a journalist, I'm excited to tell the story of industrial hemp. For me, it's a symbol of the potential of agriculture to change the world. So look, the world has a lot of problems, and I think we can farm our way out of a lot of them, environmentally, economically, socially. So hemp can do a whole lot of good work if we can get out of our own way and let it happen. Someday soon, the world is going to wake up to the fact that farming is one of our most powerful tools to mitigate climate change through carbon sequestration. But we have to do it right, and we have to do it at scale. And as we move in that direction, our farmers will be producing the raw materials for everything we use, need, and want. Manufacturing, consumer goods, our food, fiber, and fuel, while pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and locking it up in the soil. 
We will move away from an extraction model toward a regenerative model. And when we start manufacturing things here in the US, here in Pennsylvania, we're gonna see a revitalization of our cities and our towns and our rural communities. And so for me, like I said, industrial hemp is a symbol of what farmers can do. And Pennsylvania can play a leading role here. Our farmers, our land, our resources, our ingenuity, our entrepreneurial spirit, and our proximity to markets. But like I said, we need smart regulation and we need capital investment. So I'm proud to be here tonight. I'm proud to be telling the story of industrial hemp. I am proud to be from Pennsylvania. And I am proud to introduce Pennsylvania's Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Redding. Thank you. Uh, Eric, thank you. Um, you know, I can't uh, imagine a better sort of spokesperson, uh, a reporter, but just a note of thanks to, to Lancaster Farming. You know, we uh, take a lot for granted here in the state, uh, in addition to some of the, uh, the hemp uh, components that uh, Eric was talking about. When, but when you think about uh, having Lancaster Farming as uh, a publication that every week tells the story of the great things that are happening in agriculture, and then dedicating time and a person to really delve into, right, the issue of industrial hemp and what is it, what is its potential. Uh, and goes on the road and, and explores. And I described him as the, this Lewis and Clark uh, when he took off in 2021 with his family. It's a great story. Uh, but we're here tonight, and some of the folks who are part of this summit tonight are a result of that discovery. Uh, I just want to say thanks for the storytelling, the work, the really thoughtful response to industrial hemp in Pennsylvania. And nobody has done that better uh, as a publication than Lancaster farming, so thank you for that. But as a reporter, uh, Eric uh, has done a phenomenal job, so thank you for that. Uh, to each of you, thank you for being here. Thanks for uh, being part of this uh, summit. Uh, be, it's an important part of, I think, the journey of industrial hemp and developing it here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've said it each year we've done the summit, uh, and I look around and sort of take inventory of those who are here. Uh, and those who have stayed with us, I appreciate you staying with us, right? From, from early in the policy discussions about making the case for hemp to be uh, legal, and, and that's both the federal conversation of 2014, again in 2018, the work we've done in Pennsylvania since 2016. Uh, listen, you, you, you don't get in this business of ag generally without taking a long view, right? It is a requirement, it is a prerequisite for what we do in agriculture. And changing the hearts and minds of folks around hemp uh, is part of that long view. Uh, so for those who are here, thank you for working with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we are here tonight with folks in the Department of Ag who are part of the Bureau of Plant Industry and, and uh, the Team Pennsylvania Foundation who have been partnering with us, the Bureau of Markets. And as I look around, I could name many, but just to say thanks for being part of the summit, being part of the hemp discussions a, a long time and helping us as an agency, I think, uh, respond better. I agree with Eric that ultimately we've got to get this regulatory piece fixed, right? There's two takeaways, regulatory structure. We can talk about that and will over uh, both the panel discussions tonight, but also tomorrow, uh, and the investment side. Right? Uh, it's not about growing it. Uh, there are still issues in terms of uh, the varietal trials and, and what we need to do, but we need to get the regulatory structure, and particularly with the FDA, addressed. Right? Uh, we said in 2016, why is this important for Pennsylvania? We are an animal agriculture state. We're in the neighborhood with 50 million people. Uh, we have conservation needs uh, all over the state, and hemp is an answer to uh, each one of those needs. Uh, it, we said it then and believe it, it is today. In addition to that, we have discovered uh, its qualities on, on the architectural side, right? And I think it's a, amazing. That was not what we were thinking about in 2016, but having seen the hemp house, right, have, have been places where it's beyond sort of, you know, uh, debate. It's now real. 
it's here. So when we think about the opportunities for, uh, for agriculture in the state, um, uh, industrial hemp is, is clearly part of that. But getting the regulatory structure right, getting the investment piece right, uh, continue to do the research and the varietal trials, uh, look at the architectural benefits and, and uh, pull that together. That is what the summit does. It convenes us uh, to come in and think and learn and listen right, about what has worked and who has done it, how have they done it, or how not to do it, right? It's also a really important part of this journey of, of uh, uh, the work that we're doing in industrial hemp. But as, as Eric noted, it is uh, one of these crops that, uh, if you read any type of, of history of Pennsylvania agriculture, you find the word hemp pretty quick, right? It was here, the founding fathers grew it, it was a significant crop in the 1600s all the way through until it was uh, the prohibition, right? It's here. So making this case that, uh, you know, again, uh, we'll do it, but we know it's here and we know the potential of it. So, uh, but ultimately, ultimately, this is about what individuals do. It's our job to make sure we get the right structure around it from a regulatory standpoint, and I think we continue to do that. We've got the steering committee, which has been incredibly helpful to us in Pennsylvania to find the right structure and, and to deal with the multitude of issues that have come uh, before us. Uh, but it's also making sure that we have individuals who want to do this, right, who want to invest, uh, who, who have that long view that I've mentioned, uh, and are prepared to sort of uh, help us as policymakers make the case for continued investment, right? We'll do that as a department. We'll do that in full partnership with uh, our legislature, which has stood by us from day one to make sure that we have the right in Pennsylvania uh, to grow uh, industrial hemp. But we've got to keep building and keep engaging and keep thinking about how to do this. Uh, but I'm really encouraged by uh, each of you uh, being here. Uh, for being involved and staying engaged in this conversation about industrial hemp. Uh, and I think it has tremendous potential to solve some of the most important issues of our time. Right? It's about the environment, it's about jobs, it's food and nutrition. We are an animal agriculture state with 200 million uh, chickens and cows and all those kinds of things that are here. Uh, that's the potential that we see. So excited to be here. Uh, again, thank you for being part of the journey on hemp, but also giving us the benefit of your engagement, your thought, your experience in the field, on the policy side, your investment, and really helping us as a state lead on industrial hemp and inform both the discussions at the state level uh, and those at, uh, at the USDA in our federal policy. So with that, uh, thank you for being here. Looking forward to the conversation tonight uh, and learning more about it, but also uh, tomorrow, there's a very uh, dynamic program. We've tried to listen as well uh, to you and get the feedback from you of previous summits, but also pick up on those important issues of the regulatory structure and the investment uh, required. So with that, thank you for being here. Look forward to it. Thanks. So, yeah, that was Secretary of Agriculture Russell Redding, and uh, he's the only ag secretary I've ever known here in Pennsylvania. You know, he was Ag Secretary when I started at Lancaster Farming back in 2015. And uh, his time is coming to an end because we just had an election and there is a new governor. And the new governor will be choosing his new Secretary of Agriculture. And I'm pretty sure Russ Redding is, uh, has decided not, not to throw his hat in the ring on that. But he's been a great Secretary of Ag. And uh, I am really grateful for what he's done for the state, for our farmers, and just grateful for, you know, um, the connection that I have with him. So, all right. Cheers to you, Secretary Redding. All right. So now we're going to hear a little bit of Ken Elliott's keynote speech, right? Um, I am so thankful that Ken came out to Pennsylvania to share his vision with us. You know, Ken is salt of the earth. He's, you know, off the cuff. He's the real deal. He's a rambling man. And he spoke for almost an hour. So I have cut that down just to give you a flavor of what he was talking about. So we're going to hear that now. All right. So moving on, we're going to introduce our keynote speaker here tonight, Mr. Ken Elliott from IND Hemp. 
So IND Hemp is based in Fort Benton, Montana, and is America's largest hemp company. This family-owned operation is dedicated to connecting farmers and businesses that see hemp as a way to bring real and lasting change to our communities and planet. Ken has a passion for Pennsylvania, too, and the momentum we have here, and he's really looking forward to engaging with our state-level leaders to show what hemp can do for our rural communities. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Elliott from IND Hemp. Thank you, Eric. It's good to see everybody here. We've been working hemp out in Montana for, well, since 2012, before the Farm Bill. I own an uh, environmental company, and we have a, an old refinery, and we were looking at using hemp to clean up the old refinery. So 2012, we got involved with it uh, because it was pretty, <laughs> I was pretty sure I wasn't going to do much because in 2012, you couldn't do much. Things changed in 2014, and then we got into the farming end of things. We got the first license in the state of Montana uh, to actually farm. And after a couple of years of that, we recognized we probably had to have a processing facility in order to encourage more farmers to do that. And so in 2018, we uh, built a processing facility. And then 2019, we worked with a, a group of farmers, 30, 40 farmers, and we raised 10,000 acres of hemp in Montana. And at that point, it was all for, uh, for grain. So that's kind of how we got started. We're in, we're in several states. We've been in, gosh, I don't know, maybe 10 different states trying to find out if hemp works or not. Um, the, the varieties we have right now don't all work. And what you obviously need is a processing facility. And I think that's what you recognize. Secretary uh, Redding, you're right on. We've spent a tremendous amount of money doing what we do in Montana. And I tell people, what we do in Montana, don't do that, right? Don't do that. We'll show you how. I think you guys have got a better model out here. Um, you, when you see the size of our production facilities, it just doesn't fit in your, in, in your state just yet. But it will. I think it will. But to start with, you need grain and you need fiber. You need it at scale that you could put four or five of them in this state. We could probably put ten of them in Montana. You know, they're... Montana's a huge state. Uh, we got millions and millions of acres, and we don't have nearly as many farmers as you all have. So, so this is a little bit about what we're going to talk about. And if you guys see something here today, ask me tonight. Uh, catch me tomorrow. We know the economics. We've developed the industry as far as the farmer network up, upgrading. We have two ag agronomists that work with us and work closely with our farmers so that they're successful. At the end of the day, if our farmers are not successful, this thing falls all apart. If we can't put more money in their pockets than they are doing right now with corn and soybeans, there's no sense doing this. We also work with the end users, right? Find out who is it is out there interested in our product. And we've been, for the last three years, beating the streets all over the world trying to find out who wants this herd, who wants this fiber. The food is amazing. What are we going to do about feeding livestock and so forth? So we've done a lot of that legwork. Um, I used to live in Reading. My daughter that you'll meet here. Uh, she was born in Reading Hospital, so we've got a passion for Pennsylvania. We love the farmers here. Um, Eric, we appreciate all the time you've spent with us. Lancaster Farming, the support we have for you guys. You guys are a bunch of rock stars. I, you know, Cameron is in this. Cameron's here. You know, Lancaster Farming's here. Um, Steve Groff is here someplace. Lori is here. You guys have got a tremendous amount of resources. We just never, ha we do not have those resources in Montana, and that's critical. You guys have already checked that box. Um, met today with the secretary, met with Fred. The Department of Agriculture is absolutely critical. Make this thing happen. If you don't have the, the Department of Agriculture behind you, don't go any further, right? I think you got the Department of Agriculture behind you. There's some things we're going to need from the uh, folk at the legislative level. Uh, in Montana, we had to go to the to the state and ask our legislators to change the laws a little bit. They changed the laws just a little bit. Didn't cost the state anything. Just allowed us to feed our, food, our feed product to a horse, which was something that the uh, USDA didn't want us to do. But for us to be successful, that needed to be done. They worked with us. I think we, when the, the final vote was like 101 to 1 vote. And as a consequence, we've been successful since. So anyway, we're a, we're a family-run company. We're not interested in doing hemp all over the world. We're interested in hemp being done all over the world, right? Uh, yesterday, I met with some folks uh, from New York. They want to do this. 
Um, and we're good with helping them do this. I don't want my daughter, I don't want myself. I don't, this is, I don't have the bandwidth to do this in 50 states, but you guys can do it really well in Pennsylvania. We'll help you get there. That's our goal. But hopefully you get the, uh, get the impression that we are focused on the farmer. We want this to be good. This is an amazing food product. It's amazing fiber product. It does amazing things from carbon. When people are talking about carbon banking and things like this. But I think more importantly, our experience with our farmers in Montana is this is what hope looks like. In Montana, we are wheat and barley farmers, and there is not a history in wheat and, in wheat and barley that'll support the next generation. The uh, wheat and barley farmers that your grandfather did and your father did and now that you're doing, you know, the idea of handing this down to your, your kids is, is almost a curse. You don't make any money on that, right? And I know a lot of, of corn and soybean farmers are in the same boat. So you send your kids to college, you get them smart, and then you ask them to take over the farm, and then when they shake their heads, you're just, you're shocked. Hemp can do something, I think, that'll, that'll change that, so. Yeah, so that was Ken Elliott. He, um, he talked um, for a while. Like I said, he, he played a couple of videos. He tried to, you know, show what's happening there in Fort Benton, Montana, what they're doing to sort of revitalize the town, bringing jobs back, et cetera. He talked about the hemp exemption, you know, and the importance of, you know, opening up those livestock feed markets for hemp. So I think it was great that he was a keynote speaker, but probably more important that he was there uh, at the summit talking to people, you know, from lawmakers and people at the Department of Agriculture and, you know, people, entrepreneurs and just people in the hemp space. So thanks to Ken for joining us here in Pennsylvania this week. So after he spoke, there were a couple of panel discussions. The first one was a fiber and grain industry discussion and uh, the people on that panel were Ken Elliott, uh, Raj Kasula from Wenger Feeds, David Cook from Tuscarora Mills, Cameron McIntosh of Amerishon Cast Hemp, and Lori Daytner from Don Services. And then after the fiber and grain discussion, there was a hemp-derived cannabinoid discussion. And that panel included Dr. Allison Justice from the Hemp Mine, Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association, Tom Trite of PA Options for Wellness, Steve Groff of Cedar Meadow Farms, and Justin DeAngelis of Rhino Biotech. Some of these names you recognize, and I'm going to just play a little snippet from each of, each of them just so you get a flavor of what that uh, panel discussion was about. And then after each panel discussion... There was uh, like a chance for lawmakers to ask some questions, which they did, and uh, it was a good exchange. And some of the lawmakers in attendance have actually been guests on our podcast before. I'm thinking specifically Senator Judy Schwank and Senator Sharif Street. So, yeah, it was great. It was just such a, a neat thing to see the lawmakers interacting with the hemp industry folks. So super cool stuff. So anyway, I'm going to play a little snippet of each um, panel person, all right? Excluding Ken Elliott. Sorry, Ken, but you gave the keynote speech. Anyway, first we're going to hear from Dr. Raj Kasula from Wenger Feeds, who was talking about the Chickies Creek hemp eggs, right? That's a big deal here in Pennsylvania because they got special permission to feed hemp cake to their poultry. So here, check this out. Um, we looked at the composition of uh, the various hemp products, and then we also compared it with the commonly available um, animal feed ingredients in the market. The soybean meal, canola meal, sunflower meal, and distillers uh, grains. So you can see that hemp seed cake, when you compare with the other common ingredients in the market, it is either uh, green or yellow, and not any red there. So in, in, in kind of a gross um, uh, idea, you can say that it is chemically or nutritionally, it looks much better or comparable with the commonly used feed ingredients in the market. Yeah, so essentially what he's saying is that it looks like hemp is better than a lot of the other feed that they use for chickens. All right, and then after Dr. Kasula was David Cook from Tuscarora Mills, and uh, David is... You know, he's essentially a, a weaver and a fabric guy, and he's he knows a ton about, you know, what you need from 
hemp fiber to make textiles. Since uh, 2020, I've been a member of uh, Pennsylvania's industrial hemp program. Uh, as a licensed PA hemp farmer, I've faced the challenges of uh, where to buy seeds, uh, which cover crops are best uh, for hemp, when to sow, how long to grow, and the uh, challenges of the 0.3% uh, Delta 9 THC limit uh, prior to harvest. Uh, I've struggled to learn when and how to harvest and ret mature plants uh, for the optimal textile grade fiber that I seek. And the lack of processing for textile fiber uh, in Pennsylvania and nationwide, and most importantly, the, the shortage of buyers for textile fiber. And then after David Cook was Cameron McIntosh from Amerishon Cast Hemp. And you, you know Cameron. He's been on the show before. He's our local hempcrete builder. You know, he's got the E-Reezy spray applied method. He builds hempcrete houses all over the country at this point. My name is Cameron. I'm from Amerisham Cast Hemp. Just going to try to spin my wheels here a bit till they get my PowerPoint up. Um, thank you very much to Kelly and Gina and the Team PA for uh, putting this event together and as always to our Department of Agriculture, um, which I can say in my travels across the country I've come to realize is one of the best for hemp in the entire country, bar none. Um, so thank you all very much for that. Okay, so tonight here, just quickly to mention to you what we do with hemp, which is building material. It's a material called hempcrete. Um, despite uh, that term leading you to believe that it's something like concrete, it is not. Uh, it is first and foremost uh, a non-structural insulation walling material that takes the place of everything in a traditional wall frame except for the frame. Uh, so I, again, Cameron McIntosh of uh, Marisham Cast Hemp, there with my wife and partner, Melissa. Um, we are essentially set up as an insulation subcontractor and consultant specializing in hempcrete insulation. We're also a material and equipment supplier for hempcrete building. Uh, to date, um, we've imported over 600,000 pounds of hemp herd for construction from Le Chambrier in France. Um, we've installed over 18,000 cubic feet of hempcrete on residential homes from Virginia to Vermont and beyond. Most of our work is here on the East Coast, however, we have gone a bit further west as well. Um, I am a former board member uh, for the U.S. Hemp Building Association uh, and also the co-writer of the IRC appendix for hempcrete construction, which was recently approved. And then next up was Lori Daitner from Don Services. She's been on the show before. We've talked to her a couple of times about the Project PA Hemp Home, where they took an old house in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and uh, stripped it out and rebuilt it using hempcrete and hemp wood flooring. And uh, they're in discussions now about putting in a processing center there in Newcastle, out there on the west coast of Pennsylvania. You may not be aware, there are already many companies that are using hemp, certainly in clothing companies. But for example, Georgia Pacific signed an agreement with Bast Fiber Technologies. And Bast Fiber Technologies called me up three months ago. They keep tabs on us. They keep wanting to find out when are you gonna be operational? Where do you think your volumes are gonna be? They make the disinfectant wipes out of hemp. We live in what is now the plastics belt. We used to be the rust belt, but now we're the plastics belt. And we know that hemp has applications in plastics. We have major plastics companies in our backyard, one which produces um, those Adirondack chairs, you know, lawn furniture, and that's made 15 minutes away from our offices. And they are very keen on this, and we're working with them and with Dr. Kander uh, to find a solution to see if they can use hemp in those products. Now this is mostly for the legislators. You may or may not be aware, this is the, the, the bottleneck. Um, INZ Hemp in, and Bascor in Alabama, that's it, as far as large scale. There are some smaller scale capacity players that have already come online, but that is a tiny drop in the bucket. The large scale capacity that we're talking about requires about 15,000 acres to supply it. And as I said, Lawrence County alone has 85,000 acres under production. So as a rotational crop, we think that we're well positioned to be the processors for our region. Yeah, so I love what they're doing out there in Newcastle at Don Services. And you got to keep in mind, uh, again, that 
these speakers are speaking not only to, you know, this audience of Hemp Summit attendees, but also to this audience of Pennsylvania lawmakers who were there this Monday night to learn about this industry and who could really make a difference in how the industry is set up here in Pennsylvania. All right, so after this fiber and grain discussion, there was a cannabinoid discussion. So we're going to hear some folks there. Uh, first, we're going to start with Dr. Allison Justice from the Hemp Mine. All right, and so, you know, what is the difference between marijuana and industrial hemp? Ultimately, nothing. Um, it's the same genus species plant. The only differentiation is the regulatory bounds that's been put on it as far as how much THC can be in this plant. Um, and so that is what defines hemp as hemp. And then hemp, of course, can be a million different types of plants from there. Um, so hemp, technically supposed to be non-psychoactive, but like people have been saying, we certainly have cannabinoids that basically skirt around the law of um, regulation because it can, because regulation, at least in my opinion, there wasn't understanding in this plant and all of the molecules involved to write regulation properly to do what you were actually wanting to do. Okay, so talking about cannabis, cannabinoids. You might hear cannabinoid CBD and it all just seems confusing. Well, cannabinoid is that overarching term with many molecules underneath um, is a secondary metabolite that's produced in cannabis. And so you've got THC, THCA, CBG, there's lots of them. And then on top of that, there are different forms of those molecules. So you've got delta-9 THC, you've got THC acid, you know, all of this is important to understand because regulations have to be written in a proper manner for, you know, this not to be skirted around, let's say. All right. So some great insight there from Dr. Justice. And keep in mind, these these folks spoke a lot longer than, than the little... Uh, you know, snippets that I'm sharing you here. I'm just trying to give you a taste of what was happening. So next up was Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association. You know, Erica, she's been on the show a ton of times. Uh, and, you know, as always, she's very insightful. As everybody knows, CBD and all cannabinoid products are not regulated at all. The, they're not regulated on the federal level. They're not regulated on the state level. So while it's really great that we, we now have legality, but the truth is we're still living in this gray area. And you know, for several years now, I've been like kind of beseeching the state to at least look at regulating cannabinoids, and it's, it's always, you know, but the FDA, but the FDA. And, and I do understand that. You know, like in a perfect world, I think we would all prefer that the FDA step up and do it. But the reality is cannabinoids have been on the market in a big way since 2014. And when the federal farm bill passed in 2018, that just exasperated everything. And to the point that we actually oversaturated the market and saw a very steady decline in production because the market got oversaturated. So what did that oversaturation result in other than, you know, a lot of losses for farmers and, and a bad taste in people's mouths in some respects for um, having seen such a reduction and not making the income that they expected? We see the rise of Delta-8. Okay, because Delta-8 is produced by taking that excess CBD and turning it into something that's marketable. So to the point, it's also not regulated. But you can't just ban it either because it is federally legal, right? Even the DEA says that Delta-8 is federally legal. So whether you're morally for or against it is kind of irrelevant. I think we can all agree that it should be regulated to the point that people know what they're buying, that we're keeping it out of the hands of kids, um, and that it's as safe as it possibly can be. Then we heard from Tom Trite. He is from PA Options for Wellness. Uh, we're finding great results, uh, some of which I'll just highlight here. Uh, Opiate use disorder, which is near and dear to everybody and should be in the country. 
Uh, there's a lot of people that are addicted to opiates, and we've had uh, great success in getting people completely off of their opiates. We've had about 80 patients that uh, no longer are taking any opiates. The other great part of it is the other people are titrating down. You can't just abruptly take them off, but they're titrating down, and I don't know of anybody that hasn't been able to at least reduce some of their opiates and much better quality of life, much better pain relief too. Uh, certainly pain, anxiety, PTSD are three major ones. Yeah, so that's Tom Trite from PA Options for Wellness. And it, yeah, he's right. There is so much healing available from the cannabis plant. And then next up was Steve Groff from Cedar Meadow Farms down there in southern Lancaster County. You know Steve. He's been on the show a bunch before. He's the cover crop coach. He's all about cover crops. And, you know, he hasn't plowed his fields on his farm in in like 30 years. And so he understands the importance of healthy soil and what that means for what you're trying to grow. There's something about a better soil creating a better oil. This also is some of the things we're looking at in actually fiber production too, getting better quality fiber with better quality soil. The whole regenerative agriculture movement is gaining steam. And, uh, and it's, it's something that's out there that we need to pay attention to in the hemp space. Because we all want better quality products, right? Well, you know, I've been at this for a long time now and, and it's really just really cool to see how this is taking shape. You know, is this an opportunity to market this message? I think it is for Pennsylvania farmers, wherever you come from. You know, it's a little, I'm going to admit, you know, we're trying our little part here, but it's hard sometimes to make the connection. But when I talk to people, when I talk to people and tell them what we're doing, everybody loves what we're doing. And uh, so it's, it's, it's just, again, it's a challenge, but I see this as an opportunity. This is the future. This is the way we need to farm as uh, farmers. And then finally, we heard from Justin DeAngelis from Rhino Biotech. So Rhino Biotech's mission um, is the research, formulation, and development of new novel and unique drug treatments utilizing all natural phytoderived compounds in the production of palliative, preventative, and curative medicines. And the reason that I'm here today is, is the Pennsylvania Industrial Hemp Engine Project, which um, is a project that many of the people on this panel, as well as others, are already involved in. Um, the PA Industrial Hemp Engine Project is a nonprofit biotechnology consortium dedicated to driving innovation and economic growth in the, ag in the agriculture and industrial hemp-derived biomanufacturing industries in Pennsylvania. By translating research uh, into practice, and in partnership with academic, public, private, and nonprofit entities, it seeks to establish a regional supply chain, educate a workforce pipeline, and nurture entrepreneurship opportunities that will result in increased food security, reduced carbon emissions, and a more circular as well as more profitable economy. Yeah, so all in all, it was a great night full of great conversations, stimulating ideas, and just, you know, people connecting with people. And like I said, there was a Q&A after each session, uh, but I think the most surprising part of the night, at least for me, and maybe for other people too, was when some folks from West Virginia, specifically from the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, you know, made some comments about, you know, regulating CBD and sort of how they do things differently down in West Virginia. Hi, uh, we're from the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, and I was just you know, hearing what you're saying in Pennsylvania, we actually have legislative rule for our hemp products. So um, we actually have inspectors across the state who go out and sample the products, you know, gas stations, smoke shops, they're popping up everywhere, that kind of thing, Delta 8, other, other products as well. And we actually have those inspectors collect samples and they go back to our laboratory for testing. We do total THC to see if it's an actual hemp product or other things if they come up like that. So we also- Thank you. Yes. Like, so I mean, you. you know, also, uh, you know, if you all need anything like that, I also wanted to say to you that we are actually, our um, 
hemp is approved as feed for in West Virginia too. Now AFCO's not real happy about that, but it is it is there. So can can I get your card, please? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll yeah, get your card. Yeah, it's like we we definitely need to, you know. So and this real quick, how how does your department pay for that? Is it so it's funded off the registration of hemp products? I run the um, hemp product program, the hemp product program specialist. Uh, we register all retailers throughout the state. Any retail LLC that wants to sell hemp products must register with the department. Uh, we take a full product list of whatever they're selling. Um, any product that comes in the state in a perfect world, I'm, I'm not saying that we have caught everything because that would just be a fallacy. It's uh, anything that's coming in the state that's sold on the shelf that is a cannabinoid product, hemp derived, should be registered with the department. They have to submit labeling that is approved by our department. They have to submit a COA that validates whatever is in their product. And at that point, they get a certificate. Uh, any vendor that wishes to sell in the state can have you know, their certificate for whatever product's there. We go in, we send our uh, regulatory officers throughout the state. They pull, pull products, we'll test for anything from heavy metals, uh, solvents, pesticides, anything of that nature. Uh, the, prog the program is self-funded. There, there's no grants coming into it. The registrations fund everything. Um, That's amazing. So are you also, do you regulate it at the producer level, like after it's cultivated, right? Do you have processor licenses and are they being so we, regulated or are you just randomly sampling and the end products themselves? So we have the hemp grow side and we also have the hemp product side. So, so yeah, we have the industrial side. We regulate our growers, our processors, everything of that nature. And then on the other side, we have the finished product. So you have three levels of permitting for cultivators, processors, and retailers. Uh, correct, and, and exemptions come with that. Uh, you know, if you're a manufacturer, we have caps that come on to our registration costs for West Virginia growers, manufacturers. Um, we have free programs that they can enter into. To, it's West Virginia grown products, and that, that cuts their registration in half for an annual basis. Uh, we do we do all sorts I mean, of things. I mean, if they're coming growing in the state, our, excuse me, our growers, our state growers, will actually get a discount for our product side if if they grow in the state. Oh, that's, awesome. that's what West Virginia Grown is, sorry. I, I don't know how I, I wasn't aware that you had such a robust I know, I, program. Because we're so close, I was like, you kept saying New York, and I'm like, well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, that's, that's amazing. No, so, um, so on the animal feed side, are you doing it for all animals or just non-production animals, or is it for livestock as well? It's livestock, yes. Mm -hmm. Ruminant. And and are you, and your producers that are using the hemp feed, they're allowed to sell their meat and eggs and, and dairy outside of the state? Now, I'm not going to answer that because I don't know. <laughs> this is, that's not my side, but I will hook you up with someone that, but I'm, I can't answer Did that. Did you way. do it through a grass status or through a, a legislative process? Oh, so uh, through le legislative process, when the hemp code came into place, uh, the commissioner of agriculture has authority to deem whatever he chooses as um, an acceptable feed ingredient. Uh, hemp, hemp ingredients, hemp feed, everything of that nature are acceptable in livestock and feed. Uh, when you come to cannabinoids, that side of it, uh, where there, there's nothing that's grass accepted, um, it, it gets a little bit more, uh, I would say, we would, we would review it <laughs> uh, before we would let you put anything in a dog treater uh, anything of that nature, but as far as uh, animal feed, what everybody's talking about, livestock, absolutely, we allowed in West Virginia. I, I definitely need your cards, please. Thank you very much. So that's Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association uh, looking to connect with West Virginia, because there they are. West Virginia shows up and throws a couple of curveballs in there, you know, not just about how they um, regulate and test the, you know, CBD products in the state, but also that they can feed hemp to livestock. So pretty interesting, and I'm going to be following up with the folks from West Virginia, hopefully on a on an episode in the next few weeks, few months, and we'll we'll see what comes out of that. So that's my recap of the Monday night at the Pennsylvania Hemp Summit. Tuesday at the summit was a full day of interesting conversations. It started off with a sort of a working breakfast with, for the Hemp Steering Committee in Pennsylvania, and then there was a success story shared by Mark Sunderland. He is the Chief Innovation and Sustainability Officer at Hemp Black. And then uh, mid-morning, there were two different sessions. There was an industry planning session focused on how to drive investment, and then there was another professional development workshop about grant funding opportunities and strategies. 
Then there was a presentation about the Tesla Carbon Bank Program, what a carbon credit market means for hemp, and that was led by Justin DeAngelis of Rhino Biotech, Bob Mordini of Nectar Wellness Company, and Steve Scholl of Vivaris Capital. And then in the afternoon, there were a few more workshops and planning sessions and success stories. Yeah, so to sum it up, I would say it was a successful Pennsylvania Hemp Summit. For me personally, it was great to, you know, to see people in the industry that I knew. There's people in the industry that I didn't know, but then met. And of course, I I met a bunch of new people, including some listeners to our show. So thank you all for listening and for, you know, saying hi. All right, so I don't know if you can tell from my voice, but... I, uh, I'm not feeling so hot, so I'm going to wrap this up and uh, get this out the door to you. So my name is Eric Herlock. I'm the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. You can always reach out to me. You can send an email directly to me at podcast at lancasterfarming.com. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram and even LinkedIn. I'm on the LinkedIn. And uh, just yesterday, I had the chance to catch up with Nick Walters from the National Hemp Growers Co-op. He has a podcast called the Industrial Hemp Growers Digest. And so I was able to sit down with him and he asked me questions. So if you want to hear me talk about stuff, things that I was impressed with in this past year and things I'm looking forward to in 2023 in the hemp industry, you can check that out. All right. So until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. Industrial hemp. Season 2, episode 43 of the Lancaster Farm and Industrial Hemp Podcast. It's copyright 2022 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show is written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Herlock. And the music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. <laughs>